Hi, and welcome to a lesson on propagation over the flat earth. Here's the scenario that is the topic of this lesson. Here we have antenna 1 on the left, which is transmitting, and antenna 2 on the right, which is receiving. These antennas are at heights h sub 1 and h sub 2, respectively, above the earth. And the earth between them is perfectly flat. As measured along the surface of the earth, the spacing between the antennas is capital R. We imagine in this scenario that the signal received by antenna 2 will be the coherent sum of two contributions, namely a signal conveyed by a wave propagating directly from antenna 1 to antenna 2, and then a second signal conveyed by a wave which has been reflected from the surface of the Earth. For this study, we're not interested in the antennas per se, but we're going to assume simply that antenna 1 is radiating the same electric field intensity in every direction. This assumption has little effect in practice because all the rays are very nearly parallel when the range is much greater than the antenna heights. If, however, the range R is not much greater than the antenna heights, then you would definitely need to worry about the antenna characteristics. As we've discussed in a previous lesson, Transmitting antennas generate spherical waves. So antenna 1 is creating a spherical wave, and therefore we expect that the power density of the wave emanating from antenna 1 follows the inverse square law. For example, power density in the direction of antenna 2 is proportional to the distance little d sub 1 squared, indicated in the diagram. Equivalently, we say that the spreading loss is proportional to 1 over d sub 1 squared. We're going to assume that the signal received by antenna 2 is simply the coherent sum of the instant electric field intensities E sub 1 and E sub 2. That is, we're not concerned about the pattern of antenna 2 either. And this is because, once again, the waves are arriving from nearly the same direction as long as R is much greater than H sub 1 and H sub 2. So here's what we're after in this lesson. The scenario I just showed is called the two-ray model, and it's an important building block in understanding how signals propagate in terrestrial communication systems. You can probably already see that we're going to be invoking the theory of reflection at oblique incidence. So if you have not already seen that lesson, you might want to view that first. What we want to know is the predictions made by this model. The headline result will be that the spreading loss starts off being close to the free space behavior of 1 over r squared, but then increases to 1 over r to the fourth after some threshold distance known as the breakpoint distance. This phenomenon is important to know for planning radio systems. Just consider, if you need to know the range of a system, it obviously makes a big difference if the power density is decreasing with distance squared or distance to the fourth power. So, let's get to it. First, let's consider the direct path. E sub 1 is the electric field intensity arriving at antenna 2 along a direct path from antenna 1. The distance between the two antennas is slightly greater than R, so we give this distance a different name, D sub 1. Now, if this is all we have, then the power density instant on antenna 2 is proportional to 1 over D sub 1 squared. This is simply because we have a spherical wave radiating from antenna 1. Furthermore, if it is also true that R is much greater than the difference in antenna heights, then this power density is approximately equal to 1 over R squared, since the difference between 1 over D sub 1 squared and 1 over R squared will be small. The second path is due to reflection from the ground. Now, we evoke some results from the theory of oblique incidence from planar boundaries. We know that we can identify a point on the ground for which the incident and reflected rays will satisfy Snell's law. That is, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. I've shown these rays in the diagram. So, we can go on to define distances d sub 2 super i and d sub 2 super r, as shown in the diagram. So, the overall path length from antenna 1 to antenna 2 along the reflected ray path, satisfying Snell's law, is d sub 2 super i plus d sub 2 super r. Another result from the theory of oblique reflection from planar boundaries is that the wavefront curvature is preserved. Here, that means that the reflected wave is a spherical wave, 
and that's because the incident wave was a spherical wave. Furthermore, Preservation of wavefront curvature means that the radius of curvature of the reflected spherical wavefront at the point of reflection is equal to the radius of curvature of the incident spherical wavefront at the point of reflection. Said yet another way, the wave traveling from antenna 1 to the point of reflection and then on to antenna 2 acts like an uninterrupted spherical wave, even though the pointing vector changes direction at the point of reflection. So, we know that the power density at antenna 2, due to the reflected wave, is proportional to 1 over the sum d sub 2 super i plus d sub 2 super r, the quantity squared. Once again, if r is large relative to the difference in antenna heights, this reduces to 1 over r squared. So, interestingly, we have that both the direct and reflected rays produce power density at antenna 2, which is proportional to 1 over r squared, at least to an approximation. Now, that does not seem to be very surprising or interesting, and in fact it isn't. What makes this problem interesting is that we are not merely adding power densities at antenna 2. The quantities that add at antenna 2 are the electric field intensities, and those electric field intensities have phase. Now, this is really important to understand. What we get from antenna 2 does not depend merely on the magnitudes of the electric field intensities. It also depends on the phases of these two fields. For example, if the phase of E sub 2 happens to be 180 degrees different from the phase of E sub 1, then the signal from antenna 2 would be potentially very small. So we have to account for anything that creates a phase difference between E sub 1 and E sub 2. There are two things that will contribute to a difference in phase here. The first is the difference in path length, that is, the difference between d sub 1 and d sub 2 super i plus d sub 2 super r. This difference is significant if it is even a small fraction of a wavelength, and this is because we have 360 degrees of phase per wavelength. So even a small difference in distance relative to a wavelength can contribute say, tens of degrees of phase. The second thing that contributes to the phase difference between E sub 1 and E sub 2 is the reflection coefficient experienced by the reflected ray. We know from the theory of oblique reflection that the sign of this coefficient can be either positive or negative. So that's a phase shift of 0 or 180 degrees that adds to the phase that we would get from the difference in path length. So, now we need to go back and think about what we expect to see for a reflection coefficient. This slide was a result shown in the lesson on reflection for oblique incidence. Recall that we study this problem by considering two possible orientations of the electric field, namely TE and TM, which together represent all possible orientations of the electric field. Shown on the left is the reflection coefficient for the TE case, what you might call horizontal polarization and for which, in the present problem, the electric field is parallel to the ground. This plot shows the reflection coefficient as a function of angle of incidence. The region of this plot that's relevant to the current problem is the far right of the plot, that is, near grazing incidence. We see that the reflection coefficient is very close to minus 1, regardless of the ratio of the permittivities. That's not great news for propagation, since it means the reflected field will tend to cancel the incident field once the angle of incidence becomes too large. On the other hand, it's not really game over either, because the angle will never exactly reach 90 degrees, and we will also have the phase shift from the path length difference. Shown on the right is the reflection coefficient for the TM case, for which the magnetic field is parallel to the ground, and the electric field is in the plane of the screen, and so we might fairly refer to this as the vertical polarization case. Once again, the plot shows reflection coefficient as a function of angle of incidence. In this case, we see that for near grazing incidence, the reflection coefficient is plus 1, regardless of the ratio of permittivities. However, look closely at the reference directions for the electric field in the diagram shown in the inset. At grazing incidence, the reference directions for the incident and reflected TM components of the electric field are in opposite directions. So, a reflection coefficient of plus 1 for TM means that the reflected field tends to cancel the incident field. 
This means that we appear to be in the same pickle for TM that we are for TE. That is, the reflected signal will tend to cancel the incident signal if the angle of incidence is too close to 90 degrees and the path lengths turn out to be about the same. Summarizing. Based on the consideration shown here, it looks like terrestrial propagation is in trouble because it appears that the reflected field tends to cancel the incident field, and this happens in both the TE and TM cases. So, obviously there's more to the story. Remember that the wave incident on the point of reflection is part of the same wave that travels directly from antenna 1 to antenna 2. In other words, the phase associated with the small difference in path lengths between the direct and reflected paths will often be enough to prevent really severe canceling. In fact, we could expect that the phase associated with the difference in path lengths could actually be pretty large for relatively short distances. However, once R gets to be really big, we should expect to be punished because there will be relatively little difference in path lengths, and in that case, the value of the reflection coefficients will be the thing that determines the amount of canceling that we get. And there's one other thing I should mention here, and this applies solely to TM. If you look closely at the TM reflection coefficient, you will see that the trend is for it to get closer and closer to minus 1 as the ratio of permittivities increases. Now this is important because the ratio of the permittivity of the Earth to the permittivity of the air is quite large. A typical value would be something like 15. Thus, depending on the precise value of the angle of incidence, the sign of the TM reflection coefficient could well be negative for near grazing incidence, even though it ultimately ends up at plus one exactly at grazing incidence. Now, there's another special thing that happens in the TM case. The Earth has a little bit of conductivity, and the reflection coefficient plotted here does not account for that. But it's possible to puzzle out what effect that conductivity might have. To see this, just ask yourself what the TM reflection coefficient should be for normal incidence when the Earth is perfectly conducting. Looking at the diagram, we see that the reflection coefficient must be minus 1 in that case. And the reason is because the tangential component of the total electric field must be 0 on a perfect conductor. We can infer from this that the conductivity is also going to tend to drive the reflection coefficient in the direction of minus 1 for grazing incidence. The combined effect of these two phenomena is that over Earth, the TM reflection coefficient actually tends to be negative and quite close to minus 1, even for angles of incidence near grazing. Even though, once we get to grazing, it will pop to plus 1, and all we really need for this to happen is that the permittivity ratio is relatively large and there, there be a little bit of conductivity. Now, the impact of this finding on the results that we seek are not really clear without actually doing the math and then plotting some results. But first, a short digression is in order. I want to make this one other point to follow up this interesting difference between the TE and TM cases of reflection over the Earth. If you're considering propagation over the Earth, then TE means that the electric field vector is parallel to the surface of the Earth. Another word for this situation is horizontal polarization, also known as H-polarization. So, for terrestrial propagation, it is reasonable to refer to TE as H or horizontal polarization. Similarly, if you're considering propagation over the Earth and the incident and reflected rays are nearly parallel to the ground, then TM means the electric field vector is perpendicular, or at least nearly perpendicular, to the surface of the Earth. Another word for this situation is vertical polarization, also known as V-polarization. Now, we've just identified some possible advantages that TM has over TE when we're dealing with propagation over the Earth. Therefore, we can say that V-polarization has these advantages over H-polarization, at least when it comes to propagation over the surface of the Earth. So, if you've ever wondered why terrestrial radio systems seem to use vertically oriented antennas, uh, when they must be located close to the ground, well, that'd be one reason why. From this, you can also get a feeling for why it makes less difference whether an antenna is oriented vertically or horizontally when it is very high above the ground. Okay, back to the problem at hand. We put all these considerations together, and we have what is commonly known as the two-ray model for terrestrial propagation. 
The model says that in the absence of any other scattering, we should expect that the signal received by antenna 2 is the sum of a direct path and a reflected path. And it also says that the contribution from the reflected path depends on whether the wave is TE or TM, but perhaps less so when the range becomes sufficiently large. Now, how large is sufficiently large? That question we will answer in just a few minutes. In any event, we will see that the actual value of the sum field will be very sensitive to the difference in path lengths, as we anticipated. And to really appreciate this, an example will be helpful. So here is an example. This example is taken from the reference at the bottom of this page, but you won't need that reference to follow along. Here's the situation. In a land mobile radio system operating at 450 megahertz, that's in the UHF band, the base station antenna is at a height of 15 meters, that's H sub 1, and the mobile station antenna, that is antenna 2, is at a height of H sub 2, 2 meters. And here we're going to look at the electric field intensity of the receiving antenna as a function of the distance R for a particular value of the source voltage applied to antenna 1. Now we don't really need to consider that in our analysis, but this is simply just to generate some numerical data that we can look at. We'll assume that the material properties of the ground are very typical, uh, a relative permittivity of 15, and a conductivity of 10 to the minus 2 Siemens per meter. Again, these are very typical ground parameters. Here's what happens in this example. The horizontal axis is the range, r, in meters. And note that this is in log scale, with the distance between grid lines being a factor of 10 in range. This log scale is going to make it a lot easier to see what is going on. The vertical axis is the electric field intensity arriving at antenna 2. That signal has units of volts per meter, but here we express it in decibels relative to 1 microvolt per meter. In other words, this is log scale as well. In yet other words, a change of 10 units on the vertical axis means one order of magnitude in power. Once again, we prefer decibels, that is log scaling, because it makes it easier to see what's going on. And so what is going on? Well, the two solid curves correspond to TE and TM respectively. As expected, we see that the difference between the TE and TM cases matters up to some threshold distance, which here appears to be somewhere between 500 and 1,000 meters. After that, the distinction between TE and TM doesn't seem to matter. The two curves merge, and we anticipated that. Now, let's look more carefully at the low range and the high range regions of the plot. First, at large range, greater than 1,000 meters or so, that's indicated by the red box. Note that the dashed curve, labeled free space propagation, that's what you would get if there was no reflection from the ground, just the direct path. We know in this case that the spreading loss should be proportional to 1 over r squared. And the free space propagation line shows this. Note that according to this model, the signal level drops 20 dB for each factor of 10 increase in range. So for example, going from 1,000 meters to 10,000 meters, that is increasing range by a factor of 10, corresponds to a drop of 20 dB which is a factor of 100 in power. But we also see on the right half of this plot that the two-ray model predicts a much faster rate of power reduction, in other words, a much greater spreading loss. In fact, we see a 40 dB reduction going from 1,000 meters to 10,000 meters. 40 dB is a factor of 10,000 in power. So we see that the spreading loss here is proportional to 1 over r to the fourth power. In this scenario, we say that the path loss exponent, the exponent of r in the spreading loss, is 2 for free space propagation, but is 4 for our two-ray model. Now, this is an amazingly simple result, but is more or less what we see in practice. By more or less, I mean that in practice, when we do measurements uh, in scenarios to, for which this model applies, the path loss exponent turns out to be not exactly 4, but instead varies perhaps between 3 and 5. And that path loss might change with increasing range. Nevertheless, the point is that the two-ray model predicts that the path loss is much greater than the free space path loss when the range is sufficiently large. And we see this in the real world, and in the absence of any other information, 
assuming a path loss exponent of 4 is a justifiable assumption. Below 1,000 meters, we see very different behavior. The variation with range is now more complex, and it depends on whether we are considering TE or TM. However, in another sense, the situation is actually pretty simple. Note that the results are varying around the prediction from the free space model. That is, the results are exhibiting free space path loss on average, but with some additional variation depending on the distance and depending on whether we're considering TE or TM. Here is that result once again, but now with the average spreading loss indicated in yellow. We've also indicated the point at which the average spreading loss lines intersect. And this particular value of R is the breakpoint distance, indicated here with the symbol R sub B. It's fairly easy to come up with an approximate expression for this distance. Now I'm not showing this derivation here, but you can check for yourself that this expression works, at least in this case. The expression tells us that the breakpoint distance should be approximately equal to the product of the antenna heights divided by wavelength times 4 pi. In this particular example, 4 pi times 15 meters times 2 meters divided by the wavelength, which for 450 megahertz is 0 0.667 meters, well that yields r sub b equal to about 565 meters. And you can see that this, in fact, is pretty close to where the free space and flat earth propagation lines meet in our example. The breakpoint distance is a really useful thing to know. And that's because it gives us a handy tool for planning terrestrial radio communication systems. The breakpoint distance, combined with the knowledge that this is the range at which the path loss exponent transitions from 2 to 4, makes it simple to determine the spreading factor at any distance and makes it simple to determine things like minimum antenna height required to achieve a specified average signal strength at a specified range. These are all things that you like to consider when you're designing a communication system. Okay, time to review the main points. Propagation over flat earth is often modeled as a sum of two rays, hence two ray model. Each ray represents a spherical wave. One of these waves travels directly between the antennas, and the other is reflected from the ground. When this model is valid, that is, when there is no significant blocking of the rays, no significant additional scattering to consider from buildings or uh, terrain features, then we find that the two-ray model predicts the spreading loss is proportional to 1 over r squared, as in free space, but only up to some breakpoint distance. And then it's proportional to 1 over r to the fourth beyond the breakpoint distance. And we have a simple expression for the breakpoint distance. We say that the path loss exponent is 2, short of the breakpoint distance, and the path loss exponent is 4, beyond that distance. Now, keep in mind that this is merely a model. It's a useful model, but nevertheless the results may be different due to a number of real-world considerations. In practice, we find that the path loss exponent beyond the breakpoint distance is typically between 3 and 5, possibly changing with increasing distance, and if we know what that value is, we can use that value in lieu of the value 4, and the model continues to work and be pretty useful. The breakpoint distance depends only on the antenna heights and the wavelengths, so this model gives us a convenient way to do rudimentary design of communication systems, including setting of antenna heights. Finally, we observe that the TE and TM components of the wave, what you might alternatively call the horizontal and vertical components of the wave, exhibit the same spreading losses on average. The differences between TE and TM are apparent only for distances short of the breakpoint distance, and this is because the behavior of the TE and TM reflection coefficients is different when the angle of incidence on the flat earth is not nearly grazing. That concludes this talk on propagation over flat earth. Thanks for listening.